In the book, I examine what classical Greeks understood by the terms ta'ara, kiteris, and kerbesia, and what they knew and thought about the foreign, especially Persian headdresses these three terms denoted. While the focus of today's paper is on the term kerbesia, we will also look at the terms ta'ara and kiteris. This is because ancient sources, mainly post-classical scholiasts and lexicographers, often claim that these three terms, kerbesia, ta'ara, and kiteris, are interchangeable. Against this claim, I argue that the three terms in question are not synonymous, and that at least two of these terms, the ta'ara and the kerbesia, can be distinguished from each other. In making this argument, I draw heavily on the evidence from Herodotus. Before moving on to the kerbesia, let us deal briefly with the ta'ara and kiteris. The first appearance of the term ta'ara in Greek literature occurs in Aeschylus's Persians from 472 BCE. In this play, Aeschylus uses ta'ara in the, in the Ionic form tiaros to refer to the headdress worn by the ghost of the Achaemenid Persian king Darius I. Later in the fifth century, Herodotus refers four times to Persian headdresses with the word ta'ara in the Ionic spellings tiaros and tiaros. The exact foreign origin of the Greek word ta'ara is unknown. The best we can say is that the word ta'ara was of Eastern non-Greek origin. We cannot be certain, however, that the word ta'ara in its original language even referred to a headdress. All we know is that classical Greeks used the word to indicate a particular type of what they at least understood as a Persian headdress. Among Herodotus's mentions of the ta'ara, it is in 761-1 that he best describes the ta'ara's appearance and indicates which people properly wears the ta'ara. This passage occurs during Herodotus's discussion of the army that the Persian king Xerxes led against Greece in 480. Regarding Xerxes's Persian troops, Herodotus says that the Persians were equipped as follows. On their heads, they had piloi, which are called ta'arai, unstiffened, on their legs, trousers, and in place of shields, wicker gera. And they had short spears, long bows, arrows of reed, and daggers too. Herodotus says that the ta'arai worn by the Persian infantry are left unfixed or unstiffened. With the word apageos, Herodotus implies that the ta'arai were flexible and that their appearance, as well as perhaps their fit, could be adjusted. Herodotus, moreover, refers to the Persians to Ari as piloi. He therefore uses the general term pilos as a baseline for helping Greek reader, readers to understand a foreign term for a headdress, in this case, the ta'ara. It is possible that Herodotus is simply using the word pilos in 761-1 as a metonym for headdress. By saying that the ta'ara is a pilos, Herodotus would just be saying that the ta'ara is a type of headdress. Herodotus adds in 761-1 that the piloi worn by Xerxes' Persian soldiers are called ta'arai. He does not specify exactly who it was who called these headdresses ta'arai, whether it was Greeks, Persians, or some other people. The important thing is that Herodotus seems to say here that ta'ara was the actual name for the headdresses that Persians wore. This headdress, this pilos, was properly called a ta'ara. Whenever Greek literary sources mention the ta'ara in connection with Persians, there is one detail that occurs most often. The Persian king had the exclusive right to wear his ta'ara upright, or thos in Greek. For example, in the Anabasis, Xenophon has the Persian satrap Tissaphernes tell the Spartan general Clearchus that, it is permitted for the king alone to have the ta'ara on the head upright, but perhaps another person too could easily, with your help, have the ta'ara on the heart upright. In order to imply that a Persian with imperial ambitions might go far with the support of Clearchus's Greek troops, Tissaphernes rather cryptically, while imagining a metaphorical ta'ara worn upright on the heart, plays upon the convention that only the Persian king could wear the ta'ara upright on his head. As Xenophon does in this passage, Greek writers always use the adjective orthos predicatively with ta'ara. 
the syntactical formula is always to have the ta'ara upright, echin, tin, ta'aran, or thain. What this means is that there was no such thing as an upright ta'ara as a distinct headdress. Instead, there was simply one headdress, the ta'ara, that could be worn in different manners, whether unstiffened, as Herodotus explains in 761.1, or for the Persian king alone, upright. Nowhere in Persian visual sources, such as in the sculpture reliefs at Persepolis, is the king depicted wearing what Greeks would identify as a ta'ara. In Greek and Roman visual sources, however, we find one example of the Persian king not only wearing a ta'ara, but also wearing it upright on the Alexander mosaic. The Alexander mosaic is a second to first century BCE Roman mosaic that probably copies a lost Greek painting of the late fourth century. A detail from the Alexander mosaic shows the Persian king Darius III and his charioteer each wearing ta'ari. Darius's charioteer, whip in hand and facing right, wears a normal unstiffened ta'ara, such as Herodotus mentions in 761.1. It is a soft hood-like headdress with a drooping tip which streams behind the charioteer's head thanks to the forward momentum of the chariot. The ta'ara worn by the charioteer fits loosely around his head and face, but still covers his cheeks and chin. Darius, by contrast, facing left and with his right hand outstretched, wears a ta'ara that has been stiffened in such a way as to be made to stand upright. On the Alexander mosaic, the Persian king's ta'ara has a peak that rises to form a rather flat fan-like shape high atop the king's head. As a supplement to both Herodotus' and Xenophon's descriptions of the ta'ara, a few later Greek literary sources also contain descriptions of the physical appearance of the ta'ara. It is in such sources, whether lexica or scolia, that we find expressed the equivalency between the terms ta'ara, kiteris, and curvacea. A scolion to Plato Republic 553c connects the ta'ara not only with the curvacea, but also with the kiteris, an alternative spelling of kiteris. That which is called a curvacea is a ta'ara. It is a headdress which the kings of the Persians alone wore upright, but the generals wore lying down. Herodotus says that the ta'ara is for men. Some say that kiteris is the same thing. Theophrastus says that it is the kiteris in his work on Cypriot's kingship. As this scolius notes, Herodotus does indeed associate the ta'ara, such as in 761.1, only with men. This scolion not only refers to the Persian king's right to wear his headdress, which the scolius links with the words ta'ara, corbacea, and kiteris upright, but also pres preserves valuable information about how the ta'ara was worn by non-royal Persians, saying that they wore the ta'ara lying down. Drawing upon both literary and visual evidence, we can with some certainty discover the appearance of the headdress known to classical Greeks as the ta'ara. By contrast, we are no longer able to arrive at exactly what type of headdress the kiteris was. Since no physical description of the kiteris is found in Greek or Roman literary sources, we cannot reconstruct the kiteris's appearance. Neither Herodotus nor Xenophon, our two best Greek literary sources on the Persians, use the word kiteris or kiteris. This is true as long as we reject De Paul's emendation of Herodotus 790, an emendation which inserts a form of kiteris there. Unlike with the unknown etymology of ta'ara, however, kiteris in its spelling kiteris seems to be of Semitic origin. A Hebrew cognate keter occurs three times in the Hebrew Bible, all in the book of Esther, where the word keter does denote a royal Persian headdress. Unfortunately, in these biblical passages, the physical appearance of the keter is never described. There is one constant in Greek and Roman sources that associate the kiteris with Persians. The headdress, like the Hebrew keter, had some connection to Persian royalty. Some sources are explicit about this detail. In his lemma on the Kiteris, the lexicographer Hesychius says, Kiteris, a royal pelos, which people also call ta'ara, 
Some spell it Kitaris with a T. Much as Herodotus does in 761-1, Hesychius may be using the Greek term pilos as a mere metonym for headdress. As noted by Hesychius, some ancient sources state that the Kitaris was simply a different name for the Ta'ara. Arian, in particular, seems to use the words Ta'ara and Kitaris interchangeably. On the one hand, Arian says that Alexander is informed that a pretender to the Persian throne, Bessus, has his Ta'ara upright, as if Bessus were the Persian great king. On the other hand, Arian says that Alexander put to death the Mede Baruroxes because by wearing the Kitaris upright, Baruroxes had claimed that he himself was king of the Persians and Medes. Scholarly theories about what kind of headdress the Kitaris was all ultimately founder for lack of confirmation in Greek or Roman literary sources. Some scholars argue that the Kitaris was the technical name for the Ta'ara worn upright. The closest we come to a confirmation of this theory is a passage from Plutarch's essay on Alexander's fortune or virtue, where the eunuch Boga ba Bagoas managed to make Arces king, Artaxerxes IV, when he put on him the royal robe and a fixed upright Kitaris. Even here, though, Plutarch does not make explicit a connection between Kitaris and Ta'ara. Regarding Curbasia, Herodotus is the earliest author to use the word, and he uses it in two passages, 549.3 and 764.2. In 764.2, Herodotus claims that the Curbasia was a headdress worn by Sakas. He is the only ancient source that associates the Curbasia with Sakas specifically. Regarding the dress, the dress and equipment by the uh, Sakan contingent, worn by the Sakan contingent of Xerxes' army, Herodotus says, the Sakas, who are Scythians, had round their heads Curbasii, brought to a sharp and uh, point and fixed upright, had donned trousers, had native bows and daggers, and in addition, had battle axes called Sagaris. Although these were Scythians, the Persians called them Amirgian Sakas for the Persians call all the Scythians Sakas. The Curbasii worn by the Sakas were fixed upright and they were also brought to a sharp point. As Herodotus describes it, the Sakas Curbasii had a definite shape. They were presumably tall, upright, sharply pointed headdresses. It is significant that Herodotus does not use a separate Greek term for a headdress in 764-2, whether pilos or any other term as a way of helping define the word curbasia for his readers. Unlike in 761-1, where Herodotus says that the Persians were piloi called Ta'arai, Herodotus does not say in 764-2 that the Sakas headdresses are called curbasii. The word curbasia appears to have the same explanatory function in 764-2 that the word pilos has in 761-1. Just as Herodotus expects readers to know what a pilos looked like and to use the pilos's appearance as a guide to visualizing the foreign Ta'ara's appearance, so Herodotus expects readers to know what a curbasia looked like. The words brought to a sharp point and fixed upright in 764-2, therefore, serve to clarify exactly what made the Saka's curbasii distinctive. Herodotus implies that Greek readers would be familiar with the basic shape of a curbasia, but perhaps not with a curbasia worn in the specifically Sakan manner, tall, upright, and sharply pointed. In his glossary on the Hippocratic corpus, Galen agrees with Herodotus 764-2 that the word curbasia could denote a pointed headdress. Curbasia, a sharply pointed pilos, the very thing that they also call a taara. Galen uses one of the same adjectives that occurs in Herodotus 764-2, oxus, sharp or sharply pointed. One difference from Herodotus 764-2 is that Galen associates the curbasia with the pilos. By referring to the curbasia as a sharply pointed pilos, Galen suggests that, although the curbasia could be considered a type of pilos, what made the former distinctive as a pilos 
was that the top of the Corbusia ascended to a sharp point. Another difference from Herodotus is that Galen suggests that the Corbusia and the Taara were actually the same type of headdress. A final difference from Herodotus is that Galen does not attribute the headdress to any specific foreign people, whether Sakas or anyone else. Perhaps the closest match to Herodotus' description of the Sakas Corbusiae in 764-2 comes in a passage from the Roman antiquities of Dionysius of Halicarnassus. While describing the characteristic garments of the Salae, the Roman priest of Mars, Dionysius explicitly refers to the shape of the Corbusia. And the Salae wear on their heads what are called in Latin apices, piloi, that are raised high and brought together into a cone-like shape, which Greeks call Corbusiae. Like Galen, Dionysius does not associate the Corbusia with any particular foreign people. Much as Herodotus does with the Greek pilos and the Persian to R in 761-1, or Galen with the pilos and the Corbusia, Dionysius uses the Greek word pilos as a baseline or bridge, linking the Roman term, term apex, which designated a headdress presumably unknown to his Greek readers, with the Greek term Corbusia, which designated a headdress presumably unknown to his Roman readers. For his Greek readers then, Dionysius translates apex with both pilos and Corbusia. He expects Greeks to know what a pilos looked like, no less than what a Corbusia looked like. Dionysius uses the word Corbusia to indicate the specific shape of the apex. Much like apices, says Dionysius, Corbusiae were raised high and brought together into a cone-like shape. Dionysius' description of the Corbusia is similar to Herodotus' description of the Saccas Corbusiae, headdresses that had been brought to a sharp point and fixed upright. According to both authors, the Corbusia could be fixed into a high, upright, sharply pointed position. It was apparently not only the sharp point at the top of a Corbusia, as in the Galen entry, but also the sheer height of the Corbusia that primarily distinguished it from a pilos. Even in its most cone-shaped forms, the Greek pilos was a still rather low cap. A text more or less contemporary with Herodotus, the Hippocratic On the Diseases of Women, shed some light on what other classical Greeks understood by the term Corbusia. Whenever a woman's breast is afflicted with tracheasis, boil the fruit of a thorny burnet or of a bramble in water with fine barley meal and olive oil and plaster over the breasts with it and apply the leaves of a beet. Then stitch together from strips of cloth a cover shaped like a curbacea after taking into account how much room it will allow for the breast and in this way put the breast in it. Unlike Galen or Dionysius, the Hippocratic writer does not suggest that the Corbusia was a headdress. Nevertheless, just as Herodotus in 764-2 expects readers to know the general characteristics of a Corbusia, so too does the Hippocratic writer expect a physician not only to recognize what was meant by the term Corbusia, but also to be able to stitch together a cloth cover that resembles a Corbusia. The physician must adapt this cover to conform more fully to the contours of a specific female patient's breast. Instead of the Saccas Corbusiae that had been brought to a sharp point and fixed upright in Herodotus 764-2, the Corbusia that the Hippocratic writer imagines appears soft and flexible. And yet, the Corbusia-shaped cover that a physician would use to envelop a breast could presumably have been somewhat pointed in shape. If this is so, then the Corbusiae wearing sockets in Herodotus 764-2 have simply taken the naturally pointed shape of a Corbusia to its extreme. They have fixed the Corbusia into a tall, upright position by stiffening it in some way, and in the process have emphasized the fundamentally pointed nature of the Corbusia. The word Corbusia appears once more in a medical context in the work of Aratias, who advises as part of the treatment for pleurisy to prepare fomentations for application to the body. 
So let fomentations of salts of millet or warm fat in custes or bladders be placed in curbaceae. The curbaceae in this passage serve as bags in which to store the fomentations, although the precise shape that Aratias imagines a curbacea to have is uncertain. The grammarian Apollodorus of Athens continues the trend we have noticed in Dionysius and in the Hippocratic writer, namely that of evoking the shape of the curbacea as a guide for readers in imagining the shape of another object under discussion. Summoning the image of a curbacea in this way, Apollodorus and the other two authors assumed that at least some of their particularly Greek readers were familiar with what a curbacea was. The object under discussion in Apollodorus's case is the corbus. Apollodorus's thoughts on the corbus are recorded in the Suda entry on corbus. Corbus. Apollodorus says that corbus have laws inscribed on them. He says that they are stones standing upright, named as if from a stele that stands upright, or as if from their extension to a peak, because of their being brought to a head. Corbus just as a corbacea that is placed on the head is also so named. Just as Dionysius does, Apollodorus um, understands the corbacea as a headdress, for he indicates that a corbacea was placed on the head. Unfortunately, the object with which Apollodorus associates the corbacea in this passage, the corbus, is one of the most elusive objects from Greek and especially Athenian antiquity. In a similar passage, the grammarian Seleucus of Alexandria elicits the shape of a corbus by comparing it to a corbacea. From Seleucus, corbus, those which have the festivals of the gods on them, either named corbus from their structure, for they are corbacea-like, or named corbus since the matters of the gods must be concealed. Unlike Apollodorus, Seleucus does not indicate that the corbacea was a headdress. Still, the question arises, what was it about a corbus that made both Apollodorus and Seleucus think of the corbacea? According to some modern scholars, such as Ronald Stroud and Gil Davis, what a corbus had in common with a corbacea was that both items were tall, upright, and pointed in shape. Sifting through the scattered literary and archaeological clues for the use and appearance of corbus, Stroud concludes that corbus had inscribed on them either laws, most famously in Athens, the laws of Draco and of Solon, or other public records. He further characterizes a corbus as, quote, a freestanding steely-like object of bronze or stone, having either three or four sides and crowned at the top by a pyramidal cap, unquote. In Stroud's reconstruction of a corbus, the pyramidal cap would be a prominent feature of such a monument. While Davis agrees with Stroud about the obelisk-shaped form of a corbus, he maintains that corbus were instead made of wood plastered white. If Stroud and Davis are correct, then just as the corbusia could be seen as a pointed cap, so the corbus was surmounted, in effect, by a pointed cap. Recently, however, Elizabeth Meyer has forcefully argued against the pointed nature of a corbus. She expressly criticizes the etymological link that Apollodorus draws between corbus and corbusia, dismissing it as, quote, learned etymologizing fantasy, unquote. For Meyer, the corbus was steely-like in form and so was indeed tall and upright, but it did not have a point on top at all. All ancient Greek writers who speculate on the etymology of Corbusia, whether Apollodorus, Seleucus, or others, take Corbusia as a fully fledged Greek word. If we were to follow such ancient evidence, we could derive from the word Corbusia the hypothetical root corb, seen also in the root in the word corbus, a root which would mean something like cap. By contrast, most modern scholars assume a foreign origin for the word corbusia. Bailey connects Greek corbusia with Iranian corpasa, Frisk with Hittite Hurrian kerpishi, Hertzfeld with Akkadian karbaltu or karbalatu. We saw that in 764 too, 
Herodotus associates the Kerbesi as a headdress with a specific foreign people, the Sakas. Of all the contingents in Xerxes' army that Herodotus discusses in 761 to 99, only the soldiers in the Sakan contingent wear Kerbesi. Herodotus notes in 764-2 that the Persians call all Scythians Sakas. Indeed, while Greeks generally referred to nomads of the Eurasian steppes, whether those living north of the Black Sea or further east in Central Asia as Scuthoi, Scuthi, these same nomads were called Saka by Persians. A few Greek authors like Herodotus do refer to Sakai, but when they do, they use the term Sakai exclusively to refer to Eastern or Asiatic Scythians. In royal Achaemenid inscriptions, Persians mention several different Sakan groups. One group of Sakas was called by Persians the Saka Paradraya, the Sakas across the sea. Most scholars identify these Sakas with the European Scythians, the Scythians who lived north of the Black Sea and who were most familiar to the Greeks. The first Sakas with whom Persians likely came into contact appear to have been located in Central Asia northeast of the Caspian Sea. Persians referred to these Sakas as the Saka Halma Varga, which may mean the Halma drinking Sakas. Neighboring these Sakas, but perhaps farther west and closer to the eastern shore of the Caspian, was a group Persians called the Saka Tigra Cauda, or the pointed cap Sakas. These pointed cap Sakas emphatically recalled Herodotus' Kerbesia wearing Sakas from 764-2. In addition to noting that Persians call Scythian Sakas, Herodotus also says something in 764-2 that is less clear. He says of the Kerbesia wearing Sakas that although these were Scythians, the Persians called them Amurgian Sakas. By applying the adjective amurgioi to the word Sakai in 764-2, Herodotus displays a knowledge that is unique among extant classical authors. He shows his recognition here that Persians distinguished one Sakan group from another by applying identifying adjectives, including paradraya, haumavarga, and tigrakauta, to the different groups of Sakas. Unfortunately, we do not know exactly what amurgioi means in 764-2. Some scholars understand the word uh, amurgeus in 764 as the adjectival form of a place name, amurgion. For this identification, scholars rely on a fragment of Hel Hellanicus of Lesbos. Amurgion, a plane of the Sakas. Hellanicus mentions this in his Scythica. The ethnic is a morgios, as Hellenicus himself says. According to the scholarly reading, the, the word amurgeus in Herodotus 764-2 is an ethnic adjective and should be translated as of or from amurgion, and the phrase amurgeus sakas as sakas of or from amurgion. Most scholars argue, however, however that the word amurgioi in Herodotus 764-2 represents a transliteration of the old Persian word halma varga. According to such scholars, by referring to Amirgian sakas in 764-2, Herodotus is actually referring to the people known to Persians as the saka halma varga. At the same time, many scholars have seen a reference to another sakan group, the saka tigrakauda, in Herodotus' reference in 392.1 to the Orthokorubantioi, a name which appears to mean those with upright orthos, caps, koru. Herodotus mentions the Orthokorubantioi only in passing, including them with the Medes and the Paracanians in the 10th satrapy of Darius's empire. There are problems, however, with identifying the Emergian Sakas in 764-2 with the Saka Helma Varga. First, it is not at all certain that the Greek word Amurgioi actually represents a transliteration of the old Persian word Helma Varga. The transliteration would seem garbled at best. Second, the tall pointed headdresses, the Kerbesii, that Herodotus associates in 764-2 with the Amurgioi would seem to identify them with the Saka Tigra Cauda, 
the pointed cap sakas rather than with the Saka Halma Varga. As a solution to this problem, some scholars have proposed the simple expedient of Herodotian confusion. In 764-2, Herodotus confuses the Saka Halma Varga, that is the Emergioi, with the Saka Tigricauda, who, as their Persian nickname makes clear, are distinguished by the pointed caps they wear. That the confused Herodotus nevertheless had at least a partial knowledge of the Saka Tigricauda, say these same scholars, is shown by his brief mention of the Orthucorobontioi in 392.1. Whatever the term Amurgioi may have meant to Herodotus, he does say in 764.2 that the Amurgioi Sakai wore upright, sharply pointed, stiffened headdresses, which Herodotus calls Kurgasii. For Persians, the particular Sakas who wore headdresses that match Herodotus' description of Sakan headdresses in 764-2 were the Saka Tigricauda. If we take this as our starting point, then we can safely conclude both that in 764-2, um, we can safely conclude that in 764-2, Herodotus is talking about what Persians would call the Saka Tigricauda. Our most secure visual representation of a member of the Saka Tigricauda is found in the relief on the Bisatun monument. Carved on a cliff face in media, the Bisatun relief and its accompanying inscription, which were commissioned by Darius I between the years 521 to 519, tells the story not only of how Darius became the Persian king, but also of how as king he put down numerous rebellions throughout the empire. In the relief, the victorious Darius faces a row of nine captive rebel leaders, uh, the rebel leader to the far right and the last one to be captured by Darius is identified as Skunka, chief of the Saka Tigricauda. Skunka's headdress is essentially shaped like a cone, except the tip of the headdress arches back slightly. Based on the remarkably tall and pointed headdress Skunka wears in the relief, it is easy to understand why Persians named Skunka's particular Sakan group the pointed cap Sakas. In Greek visual representations, we see a headdress similar to Skunka's on those figures that scholars usually term Scythian archers. The earliest appearance of Scythian archers in Attic art is on the Francois vase dating to around 570 BCE. Among the dozens of figures depicted on the Francois vase are three archers who wear headdresses that are tall, sharply pointed, and cone-shaped, but with tops that curve forward. We see here two of these three archers. Askold Ivanchik argues that the costume worn by the archers found on our archaic attic vases is not meant by the vase painters to denote a specific ethnic group at all, whether Scythians or any other people. Instead, the costume, especially the tall pointed headdress, serves the primary iconographic function of marking out the figure as an archer. Ivanchik points out, for example, that nowhere in our literary sources for the Caledonian boar hunt, which is depicted on the Francois vase, do Scythians of any sort appear. The archers inserted into this mythic battle are just that, archers, and their headdresses in particular designate them as such. Even if we accept Ivanchik's thesis that the costume of Scythian archers mainly functions as artistic shorthand for the idea of archer, this does not take away from the fact that in their portrayal of such archers, Athenian vase painters still appear to reveal accurate knowledge about Scythian dress. What Greeks call Scythians was actually a culturally and linguistically diverse group of peoples that lived mostly, from the Greek point of view, north of the Black Sea. In this collection of northern Pontic peoples, Scythian men did seem to wear pointed headdresses. For example, on an electrum vessel discovered in the Kul Oba Korgon in Crimea, we see a Scythian man stringing a bow. 
The hood-like cap the Scythian wears here is indeed pointed, although it is not nearly as tall as the headdress that the Central Asian skunka wears at Bisatun or that the Scythian archers wear on Attic vases. Athenian vase painters could depict pointed headdresses on figures other than Scythian archers, however. On a black figure amphora attributed to the swing painter from around 540 BCE, five men advance toward the right while standing on stilts. These men presumably represent actors in a dramatic chorus. The men wear short form-fitting red chitons, breastplates of leather or animal skin, and tall sharply pointed headdresses whose long tops curve slightly backward. While this vase was produced in the heyday of the archaic Attic Scythian archers vases, the vase's subject matter appears to have nothing to do with either Scythians or archers. The stilt walking actors are no archers, nor except for their breastplates or corslets do they seem equipped as military men in any way. It is possible that the artist chose this headdress for the purpose of humor. After all, the chorus depicted on this vase might as well represent a proto-comedic dramatic performance as a proto-tragic one. Actors not only walking around on stilts, but also wearing tall, sharply pointed headgear would provide an amusing spectacle. But could the humor have gone deeper than this? Could Greeks have found something inherently humorous about the tall, pointed headdress itself? To begin to answer this question, we need to consider the other passage besides 764.2, in which Herodotus uses the word curbasia. In 549.3, the Milesian tyrant Aristagoras uses the term in his appeal to the Spartan king Cleomenes for military aid at the outbreak of the Ionian revolt in 500 or 499 BCE. Aristagoras assures Cleomenes that the Lacedaemonians, if they invade Asia and help free the Ionians, will have no problem at all overcoming Asian barbarians in battle. These things can proceed easily for you, for the Barbaroi are not warlike, while you have attained the greatest degree of excellence in war. Their method of fighting is the following, bows and a short spear. They go into battle wearing trousers and on their heads, curbaceae. In this way, they are easy to defeat. It is in Aristagoras' rhetorical interests to portray the Persians as the weakest opponents possible, whom the Lacedaemonians will easily master. In 549.3, the individual elements of Aristagoras' description of barbarian equipment all serve the purpose of demeaning the barbarians as warriors. Aristagoras' barbarians wear trousers, anoxorides, which Greeks found ridiculous. Both in comedy and in satyr play, Greeks could lampoon the bagginess of trousers by calling them sacks, thulakoi. While Aristophanes refers to the thulakoi worn by the Persians in the Persian Wars, Euripides refers to the multicolored thulakoi worn by the Trojan Paris. Aristagoras' barbarians carry bows, which as early as Homer could be counted the weapons of cowards. According to Aristagoras, the barbarians carry short spears. As the only adjective that appears in Aristagoras' list of equipment, short is significant. Conversely, Aristagoras does not say that barbarians have long bows, as we saw that Herodotus does in the case of the Persians in 761.1. Finally, Aristagoras claims that the barbarians were curbaceae. If Aristagoras has chosen, chosen Corbusia as carefully as the other elements in his description, we can assume that he is exploiting some sort of derogatory connotation to the word Corbusia, just as he does with trousers, bows, and short spears. Aristophanes' own use of the word Corbusia suggests, just as Herodotus 549.3 does, that there may have been something inherently humorous about the term to Greeks. In Aristophanes' birds, Pisatyrus asserts that the rooster, Electuron, which Greeks called the Persian bird, once ruled over the Persians. In response to Pisatyrus' claim, Euelpides says, so because of that, the rooster even now struts about like the great king, alone of birds, with his curbacea erect on his head. 
Aristophanes has Euripides liken the comb on top of a rooster's head to the headdress worn by the Persian king. Aristophanes has Euripides play upon the detail, but the Persian king had the exclusive right to wear his headdress upright for good comedic effect. The phallic double entendre in 487 with orthane, upright or erect, save for the last word in the line for emphasis is clear. Rather than using the word ta'ara or even kitteris for the king's headdress, however, Aristophanes uses corbisia. We can assume that just as Her Herodotus has Aristagoras in 549.3 choose the term corbisia for its possibly humorous connotations, so too does Aristophanes have Euripides in birds 486 to 87 choose the term. Aristophanes uses the word corbisia once more in a fragment from his play Trophales. A character, possibly Alcibiades, says, you think I have even my cune curbicized. In this fragment, the word curbicion is used predicatively after the infinitive echein, much as the adjective orthane is used predicatively after the participle echon in birds 486 to 47. The speaker in the fragment wears his cune or leather cap curbicized, curbicion. That is, he wears his cap either in the manner of or so as to resemble a corbicea. Other comic poets seem to have shared Aristophanes' apparent predilection for the word corbicea. The lexicographer Erotian reports the view that the historian Hecateus of Abdera has on the term corbicea, that which is called a taara. Hecateus asserts that comic poets say it is a barbarian pelos. Just as Herodotus does to elucidate the Ta'ara in 761.1, Hecateus or Erotian evokes the familiar Greek headdress Pilos to shed light on the apparently less familiar headdress Corbisia. Erotian also uses the foreign term Ta'ara as a gloss for Corbisia. Aristophanes and his fellow comic poets, Comacoi in the Hecateus fragment, preferred Corbisia to other fragments for uh, a preferred curbacea to other terms for foreign headwear, such as the Persian ta'ara, presumably because, in their opinion, it was the funniest word available for such headwear. Indeed, while Aristophanes twice uses the word curbacea, the word ta'ara never occurs in Aristophanes' extant writings, although ta'ara does appear in a fragment of the com comic poet Antiphanes. Perhaps Corbisia just sounded funnier to Greek ears than did Ta'ara. Perhaps, though, the word Corbisia meant something fundamentally different from what the word Ta'ara did. We saw in Herodotus 761.1 that Herodotus claims that Ta'ara was the actual name for the Persian's headdress. We also saw that in 764.2, Herodotus does not make a similar claim of, for Corbisia. He says that Xerxes' Sakin soldiers wear Corbisiae, but he does not claim that this was the actual name for their headdress. Based especially on the use of the word Corbisia in the medical text we discussed, the one by the Hippocratic writer and the one by Aratius, it would seem that the basic shape of a Corbisia was pointed and sack-like. It is possible then that the word Corbisia did not have a fundamental meaning of headdress at all. Instead, Corbisia may have denoted a pointed sack. This meaning would fit the humorous context in which we have seen the word used. In Herodotus 549.3, Aristagoras would be telling Cleomenes that the Spartans had nothing to fear from barbarians who wore pointed sacks on their heads. Just as Aristophanes and wasps and Euripides and Cyclops called trousers sacks, thulakoi, so Aristophanes in birds 486 to 87 would be claiming that the Persian king wore a pointed sack, Corbisia, on his head. Even in a more serious passage like Herodotus 764.2, Herodotus would be saying that the tall, upright, sharply pointed headdresses the Sakas wore were essentially pointed sacks or corbisii. Thus, although we do not have enough evidence to determine exactly what a kitteris was, we are able to distinguish the ta'ara and the corbisia from each other. While the ta'ara was a hood-like headdress worn by the Persians, the corbisia is a term that Greeks could loosely apply to headdresses 
but that probably meant merely a pointed side. Thank you. <laughs>